Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another tracksuit rundown. Another week, another rundown. I'm here joined by the knowledgeable Maxwell Green. So we're posting this on a Sunday. Now, if you if you watch the tracksuit rundown closely, usually you know that we like to post on Tuesdays, Wednesdays. It's kind of like a during the week type of thing. If you're asking yourself, why is it on a Sunday today? Well, last week we got together. We filmed on a Sunday. It was the end of the week. We, you know, we had all the current events that took place that week. We, they kind of happened. Um, we filmed, and I'm looking at the footage later on, and my shot, it's literally just my head. I mean, it's literally just my face. Um, so I text Max, and I say, this isn't, we, we, we have to, you know, we got to do it again. We can't give, I think I did it once before, and someone wrote, and they were like, rule of thirds, Alex. Like, you got to, you got to get it right. So, we're back, and uh, we decided, you know, let's let's give this another shot. Yeah, just for a bit of um, background on 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 what goes on behind the scenes before <laughs> before just slap tracksuit rundown. You know, we've never really had this issue before because Alex frantically checks the cameras yeah. about ten times before we actually start filming, just to make sure. And I specifically remember, you know, giving him some crap before we started last episode, saying. You know, oh, do you want to do you want to go check it another time? I don't think that camera's on. And you know, he gave me some slack back, saying, you know, we've never we've never messed up so far, so just just follow my process. <laughs> and sure enough, we completely cursed ourselves. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as uh, I get a text on Tuesday morning um, that we're gonna have to refilm this. So, so you can only imagine yeah. what was going through my head when mm-hmm. Alex goes, uh, yeah. Can we wake up early Saturday morning and, and, and refilm the rundown? <laughs> so this is take two. Take two. This is take two. But I like it. We got a no. Uh, in all in all seriousness, we got a great episode lined up. Um, this one, on okay. So before we jump into the the meat of the episode, um, which is is not so much a current events focused, uh, I would say focused topics. They're more general questions that we want answered for the twenty twenty four season. But before we jump into that, there are a couple things that happened last week uh, that we feel like we need to mention. First thing is that Holger Runa and Boris Becker have split. They are no longer together. The reason we're mentioning this is because it only feels like a few episodes ago that we talked about them getting together. Uh, you know, and the fact that Holger was kind of doing that to beat Novak or, or, or you know, along those lines. So they split. Max, I mean, you can go into the details. Um yeah, that split only about four months into the partnership. Um, you know, what we've seen is that Becker referenced scheduling conflicts. Um, you know, I don't know if Holger wanted him there daily for practices and, you know, Becker was only willing to travel to the big tournaments. Anyways, I mean, they had Holger had a successful last year making the World Tour finals and then bit of a slow start this year you know he lost second round to Kazo in the Australian Open he loses this week in the quarterfinals to um or two weeks ago in the quarterfinals to Chorch and in Montpellier so I I don't know with Holger I mean he's still super young he's obviously very talented but you know we we've had our criticisms of Holger and his attitude and the way he goes about things he's the type of guy that in my opinion that if something's not working he's going to be very quick to make a change yeah um quickly so i mean it's unfortunate because i like seeing those big names those you know previous big names um have like coaching gigs in the sport now and becker's obviously been very successful in the past so and and becker's kind of the opposite in my opinion of someone like a holger becker's pretty mellow mellow and and low-key and and straight to the point so we'll see. We'll see if Holger picks up another big time coach or, or where this leaves him. Yeah, at the end of the day, I feel like, although I agree, like you need, you know, it's good to see these big names in the coaching world. Um, at, at this level, I feel like a big name isn't going to win you a Grand Slam. Do you know what I mean? Like Holger has all the tools to win a Slam, to win, you know, Masters 1000 titles and, and all that. He's, he's proven that he can perform on the biggest stage. Uh, at this point, it's all mental. It's, uh, you know, having a Boris Becker in your corner isn't necessarily, unless that helps him mentally somehow. 
I don't think that, you know, Boris is going to, you know, just the fact that you have a big name in your corner doesn't mean that you're going to beat Novak, that, that you're going to win a Grand Slam, that you're going to do all these things. So I think it goes a little bit deeper than that. Maybe Holger's trying to figure that out and, and see what's what. But, um, yeah, they're, they've split. Who knows if it's actually scheduling issues? <laughs> that's the, that's, the, yeah, one, that's I, the reason I wanted to bring it up. I wouldn't be surprised if we see Becker end up with, with another big Player. name this year. Yeah. Um, he, he's a coach that's definitely sought after. Yeah. The other thing that we wanted to mention just before we go into the, the different questions is the ATP released this video. I don't know if you Fantastic guys have seen video. it. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. It's basically, it, it follows this, you know, in sports now that there's this joke uh, where things are scripted. I think it started with football, right? If I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. it started with football and they were saying, you know, Tom Brady reads the script or this guy reads the script and is like, you know, it basically says that things that happen in the season are, are scripted. The ATP kind of followed the same line and made this video where at the, the whole premise of the video is that everyone on the ATP tour is just an actor and that it's this big scripted thing and that everything that happens is like predetermined. And the thing that is one, it's just a funny video. Like you should go watch it and we'll link it and, and you know, uh, so you can check it out directly. But the thing that kind of amazed me is that everyone who was in it was a phenomenal actor. Amazing. I mean, like, I was like, this is professional level stuff. Like this literally, you know, usually when you have an, act, an athlete act, it looks like an athlete acting. These guys were pros. It, it, it was, I, sh I watched it. I saw the ATP post it, and I feel like they haven't, they don't really do a lot of these kind of funny skits. They're, yeah. they're starting to do a bit more where they like ask players fun questions yeah. and stuff like that. But this was the first time they made kind of like a mini episode. Um, Whoever came up with this idea, props to you. Pat on the back. Um, it was it was just so original. I mean, the fact that like Novak Djokovic and Carlos Alcaraz, those names are are actually just stage names, and yeah. like Novak's real name, I, I forget what it was, but like Novak's <laughs> real name is like Boban, you yeah. know, and and um, yeah, truly, truly very funny. I hope they keep that up. Um, I feel like we need we need to see more of the players off the court, for sure. just being themselves. Um, it was it was very well done. I was disappointed there was only like five or six minutes. I, I need another episode of that. Yeah, no, hundred percent. And also the thing that it, that's amazing is that tennis is pretty much the only sport I feel like in the world where you can get all of the best athletes in one place at one time. Yeah, and get them to do something like this. Like mm -hmm. think about the the amount of coordination it takes to get you know, soccer players to do this or, or football players or basketball players. Cause just because different teams, different States yeah. or everyone's playing somewhere else, you know, grand tennis, slams are the best at an best Australian open at a U.S. open. You can get everyone in one spot and do something like that. So it's pretty cool. I, I thought it was, I thought it was very well done. Um, and definitely worth mentioning, but Max, let's get into it. So what are we doing here? Explain to the viewers. Basically Max and I were thinking, and we were wondering what are, four or five really important questions that are or just questions and slash topics that are important to discuss and delve into for the 2024 season. Um, and these aren't, you know, there's nothing super specific. These are more broad um, where we're choosing different players or, you know, um, where we're making predictions of sort. For, for what we're to expect this season. And um, the four questions that we chose, who will finish as year end number one on the ATP tour? Can any player outside of the top four win a slam this year? Who is going to make their top 10 debut? What player outside of the top 100 will finish the 2024 season with the highest ranking? And who is the most underrated player on tour currently? So, so just so we're clear, Alex, you know, math isn't his best subject so there's five questions not four well so the reason i said four <laughs> or five is because we added a question we added a question and we weren't sure if we we're gonna delve into the last one but we're gonna delve into it because because why not okay um so five questions um let's get into it so first question being who will finish as year end number one on the atp tour yeah you know i for this question i went with my guy carlos alcaraz this is a very tricky um 
thing to predict. And I think Alec, what Alex and I were talking about is that it comes down to four players. You know, you really have the top four that have kind of separated themselves recently. Djokovic, Alcaraz, Medvedev, and Sinner. I just think the point gap between Sinner, who um, is in... Or Medvedev and Sinner, who are in third and fourth, is just too big from the next player down, which I think is Rublev. So... Those are the four that you have to pick from. I'm going with Alcaraz. He currently sits 600 points behind Djokovic. And my main reasoning for that is I, if he stays healthy this year, he's just going to be a lot more active than Novak on the tour. Novak, who's 37, turning 37, um, is just going to be playing fewer and fewer tournaments. He's going to play the Grand Slams and the Masters. But you know, Alcaraz is going to go down to South America and, and play some clay court tournaments there. So he's just going to have few or more opportunities to to rack up points. I also think coming up the clay court season, you know, Carlos, who's built his game around the, being this amazing clay court player, he didn't have the clay court season that he would have hoped for last year. You know, he he didn't play Monte Carlo. He had a semifinal loss in Roland Garros. He had that surprising loss, I believe, in the second round to Fabian Marozan. Um, in Rome. So a lot of opportunities to um, where he's not defending a ton of points where he can rack it up. I will say as we move from clay to grass court season, that's where he has to stay strong because he had a tremendous grass court season, winning Queens, winning Wimbledon. Um, So he needs to at least make finals in those tournaments um, to kind of stay on track. And then Towards the end of the year, we saw how impressive he is on hard courts. He's he's only getting better. Um, so I think he can make a real, even bigger push for those uh, hard court masters and, um, and, and for the U.S. Open as well. Yeah, I think Alcaraz is a good pick. I mean, you can't ever count that guy out. I mean, he's a freak of nature and, and is... I mean, it literally not even in his prime and, and is going to get better and better and better. Um... I'm going with Yannick Sinner, and you might look at me and say, hey, you're just hopping on the hype train, whatever. He just won Australian Open and yada, yada. Like, And that's a fair point. You can criticize me for that. Um, I think that he, Sinner has been, and this is, at the end of the day, this is why I'm choosing Sinner. Sinner has been extremely consistent over the last, I want to say, six to seven months. Um, he had a really good end of 2023 and then an incredible start to 2024. He's also someone who's just his game. He, you know, he's very skinny. He's very thin. Um, he's physically always been worse than the rest of the guys in the top 10, at least right now, as he's getting older, we're seeing his physicality get better. He's stronger. He looks better. He's obviously putting a lot of work in the gym. Um, so I feel like his game is just going to exponentially improve as he gets older, as he kind of enters his mid-20s where he's going to be physically at his best. Here's another thing. Here's another reason I'm choosing center. Um, I looked at the head-to-heads between him and the rest of the three in the top four. Um, And because at the end of the day, I agree with Max. I think the top four have separated themselves completely uh, relative to the other guys in the top ten. I, I just don't see the other guys in the top 10 coming anywhere close to Djokovic, Alcaraz, Medvedev, and Sinner. <clears throat> so I looked at the head-to-heads with, with Sinner and the rest of the, the, with Djokovic, Medvedev, and Alcaraz. And so against Djokovic, Djokovic and Sinner have played ten, seven times. Sinner's won the last two times they played. So there's an upward trend there. Medvedev, they played 10 times. Sinner won the last four times that they played. So upper trend there. And then Alcaraz, Sinner's up 4-3 overall and won the last two times that they played. So upper trend there. So I just think that Sinner is entering a stage where he's just going to be, you know, he's just, yeah, he's he's moving up. And I think he's a problem for both Djokovic, or for, for Djokovic, Medvedev, and Alcaraz, all three of them. Um, and I think he proved that at the Australian Open. You know, you could say if you're a Novak fan, a big Novak fan, you could say Novak played the worst match of his life, which, yeah, he did. He, he did play terribly. But at the end of the day, I think that Sinner is just, it's, it's his time. I think we could see it being his year. You know, Medvedev was in that number one spot. Alcaraz was in that number one spot. So now it's Sinner's time, and, and I think 2024 is a good time to do it. 
So that's what I'm going for. Next question. Can any player outside of the top four win a slam this year? Who are you going for, Max? If anyone. Yeah. Um, I think the obvious answer to this question is no. I think the top four have, have separated themselves so much. And history in, in men's tennis tells us that it's very, very rare for us to, you know, have a Grand Slam champion that isn't one of the top favorites coming into the tournament. I did a bit of, I wanted to do a bit of digging, you know, since 2010, right? So 14 years ago. Right. Um, and let's say, let's exclude Sinner in this conversation, right? Since 2010, Djokovic, Nadal, Federer, Alcaraz, Medvedev, um, have and and Vavrinka had a few have pretty much dominated that 14 year gap there's literally only two times in this 14 years where someone outside that group that I just mentioned has won a grand slam that was the US Open in 2020 Dominic team yeah who has done absolutely nothing since yeah and 2014 Marin Cilic won the US Open who you know is barely hanging on to the tour right now. So it's just so infrequent that a player outside the top favorites ends up winning a yeah. Grand Slam, especially considering how, um, you know, Sinner's rise right now, Alcaraz's continued dominance, Djokovic, who's still rock solid up there. I just, I, I don't see a player outside that top four and the top 50 and the top 20 taking down multiple um of those guys in, yeah. in one tournament, I I think you know the only the only way I see it is some fluke incident where a few of them are maybe injured, one of them has to retire from the tournament. That's yeah. that's the only way I can see it. Is there anyone in the top twenty or or you know in the, one of the top guys basically that you think could have a good tournament and and you know someone like a Jari maybe I don't know like someone random who. Who sure. might have a, a you know a bigger game or, or something sure. like that? I, Anyone? Yeah, and I think you you made a good point there. The bigger game is going to favor like a Shelton. Bigger game is going to favor um, players to knock some of these top guys off. Like I, I think a great example. Shelton's a good example. I think another you know someone that could be potentially like a Chilich would be a um, Hubie Hercatch. Yeah. You know, big serve, big forehand, plays well in big matches, has made deep runs in Grand Slams. Um, has beaten some top players, yeah. someone like that. But it's so hard to, you know, have that super super high level of um, consistency playing throughout multiple rounds, especially in the later stages where you're going four or five sets, yeah. having those you know three plus four plus hour battles. Yeah. Um, and Hubert's a big guy too. Like yeah. that's that takes him out. Yeah. Him. And he's top 10. I mean, the guy is like, he's hangs out, you know, he's, I he feel hangs like people, out there. Yeah. I feel like people, <laughs> he's part of that club. people underestimate him a little bit. And I think his name doesn't get thrown around as much. I mean, he had a couple tough losses last yeah. year. In the he's number eight in the world right now. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I, I feel like if you ask the average tennis fan, what's he ranked? Yeah. They would not say eight in the world. So, yeah. um, I also think I agree with you. I think it's going to be very difficult for anyone outside the top four to win a slam this year. Um, just based, like you said, based on what we've seen throughout, throughout the last, what, almost, I feel like 15, years, 15, 15 years. years. Yeah. So uh, what we've seen the last 15 years and also just where tennis is at now and how much better the top four are versus everyone else. The one player that I think is kind of interesting and I don't, I'm not saying that he will do it this year. Um, just because I know he was injured and he was not playing. So it, there are a lot of factors involved here. Uh, but Karen Khachanov is someone who is very dangerous at big events, and he has a massive game. I mean, enormous game. The guy mm -hmm. wallops the ball. He's gone to semifinals of, of Grand Slams before. So I, I could see him, you know, let's say things go well for him this season, and he has a good tournament. And he tends to like, you know, and like we said, he tends to do well at big tournaments. Let's say he has an amazing U.S. Open. You know, I could see him pulling off a couple insane wins, you know, against a Sinner or against an Alcaraz. Yep. Or, you know, so it, it, that could be an interesting one to look out for is Karen Khachanov potentially winning a slam. 
again, you might be like, Alex, what the f***? That's a, that's a crazy thing to say. But I just think, you know, the guy's come close before relatively, and, and he's got the game to do it, like a Shelton, for example. Yeah. He, he has that potential. No, I don't mind that pick at all. Having a good start to the year, made fourth round of Australian, yeah. losing to Sinner, eventual champion. He's having a good week. Um, this week in France, playing Dimitrov in the semifinals today. So um, those are the type of matches that I want him to start winning yeah, to be able to make. For sure. To, for me to have more confidence with him in Grand Slams. For sure. Um, next question. Who is going to make their top 10 debut this year? This is an interesting one. This is a very interesting one. Um, and there's a lot of guys that, like, I forgot. You know, I'm, I'm looking at, like, top 25, top 30. And there's a ton of guys in here that have actually cracked um, the top 10 already. So the field um, the field of choices is a little more narrow. I think, we're, I, think I know where Alex's head's at on this one. Um, but I'm going to go with the French guy. He's only 25 years old, Hugo Humbert. Really? Um, lefty, I think he's playing really well. Having, you know, he, he's been... The thing with him is he has so much potential. He has a great all-court game. Um, and he's just been kind of troubled with injuries. Two years ago, um, he was sidelined for a bit. His ranking dropped off. He was almost outside the top 100, but... End of last year, he had a great year finishing inside the top 25. He sits at 21 right now. Um, I just, I love his game. He has it all. He, he's a tricky, tricky lefty, you know, and we don't have tons of lefties now that are at the top of the game. Um, but he's a guy that I still feel like has a ton of potential in him. He's I mean, if you've ever watched him play, he's one of the skinniest guys on tour. If yeah. he could just build up a little bit more muscle, um, and he already has so much pop in his game, too. I don't see a lot of weaknesses with him. You know, he has a big serve. He has that forehand. He's great at the net. Um, he's just a guy that I, I think can continue growing, and his game really suits all, all surfaces. Yeah, I don't hate that pick. I think that's a pretty good pick. Um, I just haven't seen him have like I, I don't know I, I haven't seen him really pop off consistently like I've, he's had individual tournaments where I feel like he's been really good and maybe I'm just not informed so I might be wrong here but I feel like I haven't seen him go for a run of you know six months where he's he, just crushing it yeah he and really I, like I mean he hasn't takes. had that big run in yeah. in a grand slam or it's not like he's won a masters yeah. kind of thing but I, I think he's going he's gonna to play a lot of tournaments this year if he stays healthy. He's going to rack up some wins at 250s and 500s. Yep. He's in the semifinals this week in France as well, playing playing her catch. He's having a good week. Crushed Davidovich Fakina yesterday. So yeah. I like it. one guy I, I want to like, keep my eye on. I like that pick. Where's your so, head at? I mean, I think I, I think I know what Max thinks I'm going to say. I think Max thinks I'm going to say Tommy Paul. Um because as everyone here knows, I'm in love with that man. Um, I I do like the Tommy Paul pick. Don't get me wrong. And I also think it's pretty interesting that you have Tiafo, Paul, and then Shelton, three American guys, back to back to back. Um, mm -hmm. Tiafo has been. He has been in the top yeah. ten. So I know that. Um, I'm going with Shelton, mm -hmm. and I, my heart's telling me Tommy Paul. Don't get me wrong, but I think that Shelton. He got to the semifinal of the U.S. Um, and, and Tommy Paul's been to a semifinal of Grand Slam as well. He got to the Australian Open yeah. semifinal. But Shelton just has a massive game. And he's also a little bit like tricky to play. I feel like he's awkward. So I just feel like that's a really good combination for a top 10 player. That's something like, you know, to have a serve like he does, you're just so much more likely to beat the top guys in the world. Um, now Tommy Paul's strengths are movement and he's consistent and he, you know, he's just, he's, a, has really high tennis IQ, but I just think that it's really hard to bet against a Shelton serve and his forehand. I mean, I was watching him play, I was watching highlights in Dallas the other, you know, yesterday. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and he is just, I mean, it's like, he's lights out when he's playing. Well. He's lights out. This kid is lights out when he's playing well. Like it's serve forehand it, it comes in on the return like it's just it's if he plays well which i think he'll have 
a couple good tournaments, you know, big tournaments this year, just because he likes the crowd. He likes the atmosphere. He, he shines under the lights. You know what I mean? So I, I think Shelton's gonna gonna make his top ten debut. That's a really smart pick too, because if you remember, he was having an awful. Um, you know, he performed well at Grand Slam. Obviously, he had the U.S. Open, yeah. he had Australia, um, where I think he lost to Tommy Paul in the quarterfinals yeah. in 2023, if I remember correctly. But then he went on this awful like streak where he was losing yeah. first and second round, yeah. like from. February up until almost Wimbledon. Yeah. Um, I was just checking. He lost first round or second round in Indian Wells, first round in uh, Miami. Yeah. Like those are two tournaments where he's he should do, should and have very high to. expectations. He's going to. Should have very high expectations to do well now. Um, so now he has, has a, a bit ton, of experience. He has a bit of experience. He has he's, a ton yeah. of points to rack up from now in, in, until the beginning of summer. Yeah. So, so. I, I, I think that's a good pick, and I, I'm going with, with Shelton. I think he, he has that game. Um, so, okay, so Umber and Shelton. Next question. What player outside of the top 100 will finish the 2024 season with the highest ranking? Yeah, this is, um, this is a great question. I, I kind of went for a bit of a dark horse, but I wanted to go – I wanted to pick one of the young guys um, that I think has a lot of upside – you know, we've we've seen teenagers when they break in, you know, when they're outside the top 100 and then they break into the top 100, they just shoot up. You know, um, we've seen that with um, Alcaraz and obviously a guy like um, Arthur Fis. Anyway, so I went with Chinese player Jun Cheng Sheng. I hope I pronounced that correctly. You know, the IMG IMG legend. They love him down shout there. Out, shout out. He, if you haven't seen him play, just he has a beautiful lefty game, has all the shots, really great from the baseline. Um, and he's starting to rack up some good wins now, making the third round of Australia. Obviously, he got steamrolled by, by Carlos, but that's, that's as expected. He finished last year really well. You know, he um, had a really good result against, against Rublev, he beat Tiafo. So he's, he's starting to compete with those top guys now. And he sits at, I think last week he was 140. And he didn't have a great beginning of last year where he was injured a little bit. So he's going to have a lot of tournaments where he can start gaining some ground on, on getting into the top 100 and, and breaking through. And also, the guy's 18. He hasn't physically grown up yet. He's not, he's not a freak athlete like a Carlos Alcaraz. He's still kind of skinny and, and needs to grow into his body. So I think once he gets that going, I mean, that's going to take his serve to another level, which I think is a shot that he can improve on a bunch. Um, and just his overall athleticism, it, it's going to ex- exponentially grow. Also, just think about what mentally winning a few rounds in the Australian Open is going to do to you. you oh, know what I mean, like at 18 it years helps old, your confidence I mean, so yeah, much. And you could say he had an easier draw or whatever. Like, yeah, he didn't have the craziest draw to start. You know, that's that's fair. But at this level, beating anyone that's in the main draw of the Australian Open is an incredible, oh, yeah. incredible feat. And people forget that. People are like, oh, he's not top 15? Like, what the hell? Like, that's not even a win. And it's like, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. So um, I think that's a great pick. And IMG is doing such a phenomenal job with with the, the younger generations and, and bringing up top players. I mean, you saw that with Machizuki as well, who's top 150. So... So amazing stuff, and and you know he's got an incredible team around him. So they're definitely going to bring him. Uh, you know he's just he's going to skyrocket. I I know it. Um, I'm going with. I I'm going the uh, I'm taking the opposite stance. So he went with a young guy, 18 years old, up and coming. You know a lot of potential. I'm going with someone who's a vet, who has proven himself, um, who was in the top 10, who's been to Grand Slam finals. I'm going with Matteo. Berrettini. Um, I don't know what the deal is with him at the moment. I think, you know, obviously he's injured um, or he was injured. Um, I don't know how serious it is. I, I haven't really done, um, I haven't dug that deep. But I just think if if he's going to be healthy this year, he's going to get wild cards into the big t- all the big tournaments. So that's immediately eases a bunch of pressure. And then on top of that, he has an incredible game and he has the game to, you know, get 
and go really far in these big tournaments, which is going to get you incredible amounts of points, which is going to get you super far or super high up in the rankings. So I just think that he has all the kind of things going. He has all the things going in his favor in order to actually end up with the highest ranking as the as a player who's currently outside of the top 100. Um, another player, if we're going young guys, I'm going Zapieri. He's a young guy, 22 years old. Um, you know, he's had some good results recently. And uh, I just think that, yeah, these Italians, I don't know. The Italians stepped it up. There's something in the water in they Italy going on. It they're, up. they're everywhere. Musetti, Berrettini, Sinner, Zipieri, Arnaldi. Arnaldi yeah. Arnaldi's a guy who's, you know, who's really good as well, who's, what, 30-something in the world. So uh, it's the Italians, they've I, – I, and I love this. Sorry, side note, but I love it because you see countries – you could just tell that they have classes – of people that they've developed at one time. It's like cohorts almost. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like look at what Czech, with Czech Republic and the women. The women's tennis, there's about, I, I want to say, it feels like there's a, the top, all the top 100 are, you know, 70% are from the Czech Republic. So it's like, I love it when you see cohorts of players uh, go through and from, from a country. It just shows that that country's invested a lot and it's paying off. Yeah, and I think I read an article last year that... Um, you know, Italy, for being obviously not the, the biggest country in the world, hosts a tremendous amount of challengers yeah. tournaments, like more than the U.S. by far. Yeah. And you can kind of see they, you know, because they're obviously giving wild cards to all the Italian, young Italians um, in those tournaments. And you can kind of see them develop like that next crop of players. You look through you look through the top 200, even like the edge of, you know, the top 100. There are so many Italians like popping up new names that you know yeah that I've never even heard of you know we saw one guy to mention too who I, I think is 18 or 19 um, who had a good run at the Australian is, is Flavio Coboli um, who last year I had you know I didn't even know the name but you know he made third round of Australian Open this year he's 21 years old by the way but just there's just constant influx of, of these players coming in. So Italy's doing something right over there. So let me ask you, how many players between 100 and 200 are Italian, are Italian right now? Um, I'm going to say 15. Close. 12. 12, or 12 okay. or 13. I might have miscounted, but yeah. it's 12. I think it's 12. Um, 12 players. That's, that's incredible. I mean, the fact that I went 15, like that just shows... 12 players inside in the top 200 that were between 100 and, and 200 and yeah. I, I don't even know how many are in top 100 i mean a, a few for sure right obviously arnaldi musetti sinner uh sanego so you guys you have i mean honestly probably like 18 or 17 players that are in the top 200 right now yeah it, that's it's... absurd that's absurd yeah so shout out to italy i mean wow what a that's bananas. Anyway, um, last. Just to, oh, go, I was go. gonna just say, just to touch on your your picks very quickly. The um, I like the Zapieri a lot. I think he he's a player with a lot of potential. Um, he's doing doing having a good start to the year already. Berrettini, that one scares me a little, just because we don't know what the um, timeline of this injury is. We haven't seen him play since the U.S. Yeah. Open. He withdrew from the Australian, and just these guys that have touched, you know, the top of the tennis world you know this is a guy that was former top 10 player for years has been in you know he's been in grand slam finals wimbledon, wimbledon yeah, final against... he's he's was so close to um you know hoisting up a grand slam trophy you know does he still have that fire in his belly to work his way back up the rankings you know we've seen a guy like team who had that big injury and you know I know you might think it was more severe, but has just never been able to claw his way back up. And now he's, you know, questioning if this is going to be his last year of retirement ready. So it's always tricky for me, the guys that have, you know, almost touched, almost had the belt wrapped around their waist and then they fall back down the rankings. Well, Can they climb their way back up? The only thing I'll say, the difference between team and Berrettini is that team has actually won a slam. So that's a big difference. Like, think about it. If you're a bear team, you're like, F like I got to a final. I played Djokovic. Like, I, you know, Djokovic is getting older. 
I can, and he's probably thinking, I can beat Sinner. I can beat Alcaraz. I can beat Medvedev. I can beat these guys. He's, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if that's going through his head. And so team, a big thing with team is he won a grand slam and he was like, I won a slam. Like now what kind of thing? Mm-hmm. I feel like that played a part in it. Berrettini, I don't think has had quite, he hasn't, ha- he hasn't touched the top quite yet. He was number six in the world, I think, um, which is amazing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, he was at the top of the top, but like still, like it'd be great to win a slam. It'd be, he, he has achievements that are left to be, to be accomplished. Um, so I think that's a big part that, that is a differentiator between him and team. Fair enough. So um, last but not least, who is the most underrated player on tour? Um, Max, I mean, we already know, we've discussed this, but we have the same pick, um, and we went. With, we both went with Manorino. Um, you want to give your reasoning as to why you chose Manorino? Yeah, I mean, I thought about this question, you know, what player are you most shocked to see so high in the rankings? Or, like, what game style would you least expect to take you so high in the rankings? And you look at everyone that's in the top 20, top 25, you know, pretty much everyone has at least, like, one flashy shot that or they weapon can, yeah or, or like big weapon that they can rely yeah, on yeah. adrian manarino the guy is 35 35 he's hit his career high ranking he has zero weapons he's just a brick wall and he basically massages the ball around the court um he's a tricky lefty he doesn't give you anything and he's racking up like the best results of his life um you know, we saw him have a very good run at the Australian Open. Yeah. Uh, obviously, he can't. Thing is, I was talking with Alex. Is like, it's going to be very hard for him to knock off one of the very top names. Um, pretty Some... pretty much any day. You know, he just doesn't have that game style. But he's very rarely playing like this. He's very rarely going to lose to anyone that's below him, and pretty much be fifty fifty with guys that are you know at his ranking plus or minus a couple spots. Couple funny things to note about Manorino this week. Um, the Dallas uh, Alex knows the Dallas Open is going on right now, and I I saw a photo on Twitter of everyone's string tension that was playing in the Dallas Open. And I first of all, I love when they post that. It's just so interesting to me. Manorino had Manorino was the lowest string tension out of everyone by far. And his name on the board next to it had 9.5 kg. I'm, I use pounds, so I've, I had no idea what that meant, but I, I did the conversion, and it's about 22 pounds. Which is 22. I don't know what you, know, I don't know what you used to string your racket about. I was like 54, 56, I was, which I thought was fairly average. I was 57. So. Okay. 22. I mean, that ball must, if we picked up that racket, the ball must fly off of it so just to give people that don't understand tension and and i'm not the best we should honestly have fabian on to to talk about (laughs) to talk about this because he's the stringer but the basically 22 pounds of tension right it's extremely loose so when you hit the ball the ball just catapults forward versus when it's and there's less control there's more power but there's a lot less control when you have a super tight tension or, or when it's like 57 or sometimes even higher, the string, it doesn't move a lot. So when you hit the ball, it doesn't catapult forward as much, but you have a lot more control and feel and, and all that stuff. So the fact that he's at 22 pounds, I mean, we're at 57 and that's 54 also with and 57. The, with the that's the style average. that he plays. It, it's crazy. It, it shocks me. Also, one other note that's pretty funny is that Menorino this week in Dallas might – be having the easiest easiest path to a final to an ATP final I've ever seen. Listen to this, okay? He got a buy in the first round because he was seeded top four. Okay. He was supposed to play Nishioka in the second round. Withdraw. Nishioka withdrew. Okay. Then he plays Duckworth in the quarterfinals. He wins the first set six two, and then Duckworth retires three one in the second set. So he is now in the semifinals against Marcos Giron, which is very winnable, 
and has not even played two sets. That's unreal. But that's honestly probably worse for him, though, because now he hasn't played a match, and now he has to play. I don't know. Maybe 35-year-old legs. He, he likes a bit of, bit of rest. Know. We'll see. It's funny. Also, they asked him a question. They were like, how are you doing this at 35? Like, what's your secret? And he's like, I started drinking tequila. And it's like, <laughs> the guy literally he, probably just is like having fun out there. Yeah, he seems stuff. like a fun guy to hang out with. So, it, I mean, and you know what's also, I would like to make a point that's kind of, it's just a little bit of a tangent, but it's related to Manorino. Um, I think the fact that Manorino is able to beat someone like a Shelton, but then isn't, but then gets crushed like six oh six oh six two or whatever by someone like a Novak, shows why Novak and Medvedev and Sinner are or an Alcaraz are no. I wouldn't even put Alcaraz in there. I'd say like someone like a Novak and a Medvedev. They both have weapons, but they're both just as consistent as someone like Manorino. Yeah. So literally, there's nothing the you game can do. style just doesn't work. Yeah. It's just nothing you can do versus a Shelton. He doesn't have the weapons that Shelton does, but he's way more consistent and is able to win through consistency. So it just shows that, like, yeah, Shelton's number 15 in the world, but Djokovic is Djokovic because he has the weapons similar to what Shelton has. I mean, not as big of a serve, but the point is is that he has those weapons, but he's also just as good at keeping the ball in play as Manorino is. And I, I thought that's pretty interesting, personally. Yeah. Um, before we wrap it up, let's get into the point of the week. And it's not this week's point. It's last <laughs> week's point because we got to highlight it again. College tennis. We got a college tennis point. TCU versus who? God, I can't even remember now. I, I TCU think, versus some other school. I think it was TCU versus Stanford. Stanford, that's right. TCU versus Stanford. Stanford guy double faults. TCU guy in his face rips a big come on. The whole team goes nuts. Uh, we want to highlight that point just because it shows the beauty of college tennis and how no one gives a sh- and it's just ruthless. There's no etiquette. It's, it's it, you know, tennis is quote unquote gentleman's sport or whatever they say it is, not in college. Uh, they're in your face. They're, they're trying to get into your head and there's no reservations, no holding back. Um, so we thought we'd highlight that and, and show the, the point. But, um, but yeah, Max. For, for all those tennis purists out there, that's, for, that's a good point to show them. Exactly, exactly. Um, guys, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you know thanks for watching appreciate the support hit that subscribe button hit the like button join the family max thank you for joining thank you for filming again um hopefully this time there are no issues which i don't think that there will be because we double check triple check quadruple check checked. <laughs> <laughs> so guys thanks so much appreciate the time and until next time peace, peace.